Over the last several weeks, we have been looking at the theme of human suffering and God's sovereignty. Naturally, such a topic, uh, topic brings about some difficult questions. One of those questions that is often raised by unbelievers when arguing against our faith will be addressed today. You've likely heard this objection if you have any experience with apologetics, that is, the practice of defending the faith. In fact, this is probably the most common objection to faith that I have seen on par with the argument of evolution disproving the Bible. The objection is this. If God is good, why does he allow suffering or evil? Or maybe you've heard it uh, more similar to this uh, way of putting it. If God is good, why do bad things happen to people? And that's what we're dealing with today, the problem of evil. Now, how would you answer this question that people often raise? It's a difficult one, isn't it? Well, if you care about defending the faith at all, then this subject should be of great interest to you. But not only that, congregation, we will also be dealing with integrity in today's text. Integrity, and these two are linked together in our text today. This uh, teaching on integrity that we see in the book of Job will provide us with a very practical outlook for everyday life. Therefore, if you care about the Christian life and living according to God's word, this section of the Bible should not be ignored. We will be examining this subject by looking at a case study, if you will. We've been talking about the subject of suffering in God's sovereignty for a few weeks now, and in this final week, we get to see an example of everything that we've been talking about play out in a story. When I was a younger man, I had the opportunity to go over to a few of my friends' houses and explain the Bible to them. This was in my first few years out of high school, if I remember correctly. I remember going to a particular young man's house and showing him a Bible. He flipped through it slowly, looking at all the names of the books, and then he came to the book of Job. He looked at it and said, the book of Job, does that tell you how to get employment as a Christian? Little did he know that Job, not Job, was not a guide on Christian employment, but rather it details the story of a man named Job and his suffering. This is where we will spend the majority of our time on this Lord's Day in the book of Job. We are chiefly concerned with chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, but for those verses to make any sense at all, I must give you a recap of the book up to this point. Now, if I were to summarize Job, the person, at the beginning of this book, how we, how we see him in chapter 1 at the very beginning, if I were to do that in one word, that word would be abundance. Abundance. Job had an abundance of many things. He had an abundance of children. He had ten children. He had an abundance of wealth. The first few verses of chapter 1 tell us that he had over 10,000 animals. I couldn't imagine owning 10 animals, let alone 10,000. Imagine the amount of land that one would have to own to maintain 10,000 animals. Job also had many servants, seemingly to help him manage his estate. And all of this is why verse 3 in chapter 1 says this about Job. This man was the greatest of all the people of the East. Job also had an abundance of holiness. We are told that he was blameless and upright. He even offered sacrifices for his children early in the morning. But starting in verse 6 of chapter 1, the tone of the whole story changes. God and Satan are having a dialogue. God brings up to Satan how Job is an upright man. He brings it up almost out of nowhere. He says, have you considered my servant, Job? And Satan says to him, and I'm paraphrasing, that Job only serves God because
because God has blessed him so much. God has been very generous in his dealings with Job. Satan proposed that if God were to take everything away from Job, he would actually curse God. And you know what? God allowed that to happen. He allowed Satan to take everything from him. So Job gets the news all at once from several messengers, back to back to back to back, that all of his animals, wealth, and children have been taken from him. Basically, all in the snap of a finger, Job lost everything. Put yourself in that situation. <clears throat> in the blink of an eye, your bank account says zero dollars, and you've lost everything, and your children are gone. Now I think Job responded quite well to this news. Let me read to you verses 20, 21, and 22 of chapter 1. Those verses say, Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return, or shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Amazing. Simply amazing. Not only does he refuse to blame God, but he actually blesses God. I'm going to repeat that. He blessed God after hearing this news. How many of us would react like that? Those verses tell us that Job's response was sinless. Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. How many of our responses to something like that would be sinless? As chapter 2 opens, God is talking with Satan again. And just as uh, God did in the first conversation, he brings up how Job is upright. The Lord said this to Satan. He still holds fast his integrity. Although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. So Satan was wrong. Job did not curse God when all was taken from him, but he blessed God instead. So Satan doubles down. And he says that Job would curse God if Job's health was taken away. That again is a paraphrase. And so God allowed Satan to harm Job. God told Satan not to kill him. Sores, worse than you could imagine, covered Job's body. I'm not going to go into the graphic detail about how bad these sores were, or at least could have been, based on... Uh, the text. But these were not pimples, folks. These were really, really bad sores. They were awful. So bad, in fact, that Job tried to scrape them off with shards of pottery. What a dreadful scene. And this is where we really want to focus our attention. In the next two verses, we see a positive example and a negative example of people reacting to suffering. And I think we can learn a lot from looking at these two examples. So verses 9 and 10 of Job 2 say this. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God? And shall we not receive evil? In all of this, Job did not sin with his lips. In verse 9, we meet Mrs. Job. We aren't given her name, so we'll just call her Mrs. Job or Job's wife. I want you to remember as well, as we're looking at this, that the suffering of Mr. Job is the same as the suffering of Mrs. Job, minus the new skin problems. She lost her children, too. She lost everything as well. Job and his wife are essentially in the same boat. Now, how does she react? She gave up. She fell apart. She was ready to throw in the towel. I think that it's worthwhile to examine her two statements in verse 9. So we'll do just that. First, she questions the fact that Job has stuck to his integrity. 
that he maintains his integrity. She said, do you still hold fast your integrity? The NIV says, are you still maintaining your integrity? So what is integrity anyway? Well, let's ask this question. What happens to something if it disintegrates, it falls apart, crumbles? She is asking, essentially, why haven't you fallen apart yet? How come you have not given up on this God of yours that has put us in this terrible situation? Here we have a negative example of how to react during suffering. Something dreadful, unthinkable happens to you, and you blame God for your problem. You are upset with him about how he has treated you. Maybe that's happened to you before. Maybe you've felt that way before. But dear friends, this should not be the case. And for reasons that we will discuss later, um, it should not be the case. We'll look at that later. For now, we'll press on. Looking at the rest of the verse, we can see that not only uh, that she, we see that not only she has fallen apart, but she is also trying to pull Job down with her. She is trying to make Job angry with God as well. She tells Job to just curse God and die. What does that mean? She tells Job to just give up on worshiping God, renounce God, and just curse God so that he might maybe kill Job and then he can be free from this suffering. Here we can see how the influence of sin can be spread from person to person. People who are not in the proper frame of spirit will offer advice that is sinful. And they will advocate that you participate with them in their sinfulness. However, we as Christians need to recognize that all advice needs to be weighed against Scripture. At least advice that deals with spiritual things. Basically, I'm telling you to be careful when people suggest that you do something. We need to train our minds like lawyers to be able to counter sinful suggestions and reference the law of God in our minds when people tell us whether or not we should do something. They give us advice. If someone tells you to give up on God while you are suffering, a mind that is guarded with the scriptures will not be swayed into evil. We need to be careful as well about who is influencing us. It is as Proverbs 13.20 puts it, Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. One last note about Job's wife. I do not mean to be overly harsh regarding her reaction. I could not imagine the pain that she felt at that time. But a negative example is a negative example. And hers is one worth examining. Now, in verse 10, we see Job's response. <clears throat> Job was a man of integrity. In fact, God said that he was a man of integrity. And his wife recognized that he was a man of integrity as she asked him, why are you holding fast to your integrity? And while Job doesn't always have the right response throughout uh, the book that bears his name, his response to his wife is a good one. I think there are three things that we can learn from verse 10. These three are examples of what integrity, or standing firm, in suffering looks like. First, Job did not give in to evil, but rather he rebuked it. He rebuked wickedness. How did he respond to his wife's proposition? You know, the one about cursing God? He said, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Now, what does he mean here? Well, he says that such an idea is foolish. She's speaking with the spirit of the age. Now, looking at things in a drama-free environment, in a rational perspective, away from the problem, removed from, you know, the suffering. Yes, cursing God is the most foolish thing that one could do in this world. Distancing yourself from God, th there's nothing worse that you could do. We have a duty as Christians to rebuke the sin of other believers. Now, we are to do this in a loving way. We are to be loving while, we, while we're doing this, not abrasive. There is a wrong way to rebuke people, you know. But this duty of lovingly rebuking people and standing firm for the truth 
becomes infinitely more difficult when we're suffering. Here's Job, suffering worse than anyone could ever imagine, and when his wife of all people suggests that he curses God so that he might die and have peace, he stands firm. And I think that Satan purposefully did not kill Job's wife. Think about it. Hearing the suggestion of uh, his wife might have actually hurt him more than hearing that she died. Here is your own spouse, and they are completely turned against God, so it seems. This was just another variety of Job's suffering. One commentator says that she is the one, quote, whom Satan had spared, that she might be a troubler and tempter to him. For it is his policy to send his temptations by those that are dear to us. We ought, therefore, carefully to watch that we be not drawn to any evil by them whom we love and value the most. End quote. So here is Job in the middle of this enormous trial, and he stands firm. He could have just ignored her. He could have just brushed her off. But he did what was right and corrected an ungodly attitude in his wife, whom he's supposed to care for and love, and she is a believer, so he is to rebuke her. When done lovingly and gently, a rebuke can be the most loving action that one can perform for another Christian, depending on the circumstance. Proverbs 25, 12 says, like a gold ring or an ornament of gold is a wise reprover to a listening ear. Therefore, let us rebuke properly when the time comes, in the right way, gently, not beating people up while we're doing it. But a loving correction is one of the best things you could do for somebody when they need to be corrected. Second, Job humbled himself before God. He told Mrs. Job that her suggestion was foolish, and then he gave her a question that summed up his reason as to why the suggestion was foolish in the first place. He asks, shall we receive good from God, and shall we not receive evil? Now before I go any further, I must say that the word evil in the ESV is not the normal way that the word is used nowadays. That is an old school way of saying adversity. I believe that's how the King James uh, uses, uh, or that's the word that the King James uses in this verse, evil. But the NASB says adversity, in fact. The NIV says trouble. Job is not talking about a moral good and evil. He's talking about a desirable and non-desirable kind of outcome. Blessing and adversity. Good times and trouble. Those kinds of things. So Job asks the question, why can we not accept hard times from God? We accept good times from him. So why can't we accept the bad? What a great attitude to have. Job does not object to his trial. He has humbled himself before God, and he just accepts whatever God has in store for him. How many of us fail at this when we suffer? How many of us don't have this attitude when bad things happen? If we're going to have integrity while in a trial, we must adopt a humble outlook like Job did. Be willing to accept what God does in your life. Third and finally, we're told that in the middle of all this, Job did not sin with his lips. If we were to have integrity, we were to not complain. Complaining is the product that a sinful heart produces. If you are discontent deep down, you will express such discontentment with your lips. <coughs> If we as Christians are not going to sin with our lips when we suffer, we must go past the lips and examine our soul. We must hunt down our discontentment and not allow it to take up residence in our hearts. We need to evict our dissatisfaction with God's plan. Much prayer and study will help us to do this with the Spirit's help. Now, we must step back from this story and we need to ask the question, why? Why did God allow this to happen? If we wanted to go even deeper, we could ask the question that 
many atheists present when debating Christianity, and we've touched on this already. If God is good and sovereign, why does he allow sin and bad things to happen? They argue that if God is good and he does not prevent evil, he must not have control over the world. And therefore, he is not sovereign. But then they also argue that if God is sovereign and in control of everything, but he doesn't prevent the bad things, he can't be good. This is called the problem of evil. And how would you answer such an objection? That's a hard one. Well, the simple answer is that man's definition of what is good and bad is not God's definition. To be clear, I'm not talking about morality, but rather favorable and non-favorable outcomes. Let's say that something bad happens to you. You are inconvenienced. You are sad. You ask, well, God, why such a terrible thing has happened to you? However, I think it is foolish for us to say that everything that we do not like is bad. You see, this is a false standard. The standard for what is good and bad is not up to us. What is favorable and not favorable is really not up to us, but rather it's up to God. If God is both good and sovereign, then anything that happens has a purpose. And ultimately, that purpose is for good. We often hear the question, what is the chief end of man? That is, what is man's main purpose in life? But we never ask the same thing about God. We say that man's purpose is to bring glory to God. Well, what do you think God is doing? The simple truth that you need to learn here is that God works everything out for his glory. Now, is that vain? Is that arrogant for him to do? No, no, no. The best thing that someone can do is to point someone to God. So since God is infinitely good, the best person or thing that you could possibly point someone to, he always points us to himself. You see, God is pointing us to good himself. He is pointing us to himself. We don't always see it. We don't always realize it. But that's our fault, not God's. We get caught up in our own suffering and focus on our own problems and never consider that God is using such an event for our own good by drawing us closer to him. So the short answer to the problem of evil is that just because you don't like how something plays out doesn't mean that it is bad in that sense of the word, that um, it's not desirable. It might not be desirable for you in the moment, according to your own wants and desires, but it is in accordance with God's plan that God is good, so it is good. Now, that's a hard pill to swallow when faced with the loss of a loved one or when you yourself are facing a terminal illness. But God has a plan for all those things. He works them out for our good. These trials strengthen us spiritually. We discussed that in past weeks. And keep this in mind. When we die, if we are a believer, we will not have any more problems. There will be no more suffering. And quite frankly, I'm looking forward to that. How then can we accept eternal joy and life in heaven from God and not accept the few years of suffering here on earth. Job put it best when he said, shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? Or as one commentator put it, if we receive so much good for the body, shall we not receive some good for the soul? That is some affliction by which we may in which we may be partakers of God's holiness. However, if you are not a believer in Christ, you face an entirely different kind of problem. You have a problem related to evil, but this is an evil of the more commonly expressed type. If you are not a believer, you have not dealt with your sin before God. The Lord will condemn you to hell 
unless you repent of your sins and turn in faith to Christ as your Savior. How else can you possibly hope to go to heaven? You do not have a thought process centered around the joys of the next life. You merely live for your own desires. But this kind of eternal perspective that accepts suffering in this life also hopes to obtain a better life in the next. This kind of outlook will help Christians in times of suffering and will provide us with the framework to build integrity so that we will not fall apart in times of need. Congregation, we need to trust God that he knows what he's doing. When things that we don't like come our way, we need to trust him because he's sovereign. We need to accept both good and evil 